the Vox Markets podcast with Justin Waite. Nothing in this podcast is intended as investment advice and the people in this podcast may hold positions in the stocks they talk about. Do not buy anything based solely on a tip or recommendation. Please do your own research. Welcome to the podcast on Tuesday, the 23rd of February, 2021. On the podcast today, Craig Martin, chairman of Dynam Capital, the investment manager for Vietnam Holding Limited, it's VNH ticker. And Craig discusses their progress as detailed in their monthly investor report. Also on the podcast, Glenn Goodman, former ITV News business correspondent and now the author of The Crypto Trader, covers this week's Bitcoin and crypto sell-off. In fact, it's happened the last two days. Where will it stop? You do a sell-off, let's be honest. Uh, also on the podcast, in fact, we talked about that. We've mentioned that a couple of times, saying, when is it going to sell off? It's bound to sell off sooner or later. Well, it started to sell off. Uh, okay, and also on the podcast, I have two lists for you. Top five most followed companies on Vox Markets in the last 24 hours. And the top five most read RNSs too. You can check out both these lists at voxmarkets.co.uk where you'll also see lots of other content. In fact, this Canabo Group secures first UK medicinal cannabis agreement since IPO. Um, there's also something there on 88 Energy uh, and Strategic Minerals. Check that out. Lots of content right there on the page. Uh, let's just check out our COVID-19 index. Biggest rise of the day is Gene Drive at 45 uh, percent of 116. Biggest faller, Inspiration Healthcare Group, down 11.4 percent to 93 pence. Check that out at voxmarkets.co.uk. Vox Markets is an online community of investors that runs a free mobile and desktop platform that allows you to track news and updates about any UK listed company, offering RNS push notifications, detailed charts, pricing data, and much more. Find out more at voxmarkets.co.uk forward slash app. And joining me on the podcast right now is Craig Martin, chairman of Dunham Capital, which is investment manager for Vietnam Holding, which is VNH ticker. Craig, thanks for joining me. My pleasure. Great to be with you again. Yeah, well, you've just uh, released a, a monthly investor report. So we'll dig into that and see how it's going. But uh, for people not familiar with Vietnam Holding, VNH ticker there, just explain, give us a summary of what it's about, if you could, Craig. Sure. So Vietnam Holding is listed on the main board of the London Stock Exchange. It's an investment trust that focuses solely on investing in the exciting market of Vietnam. It's a, an active portfolio, a, a concentrated portfolio. We've got between 24 and 26 stocks at most most times, uh, really participating in the, in the growth of the Vietnam market. So it can be bought and sold uh, through the broker. Uh, stock is traded on London Stock Exchange. Um, it's been going since 2006. We've been managing it for about three and a half years. And it's a, a very nice way for people to look to participate in, in the growth of Vietnam. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, let's, let's talk about uh, how it's going in Vietnam, because uh, in your RNS, uh, you've got a headline of, uh, you know, back to the future. So, uh, you know, how is business in Vietnam and how's the fund performing? Well, it's been, if you look back over the last three, four months, it's, it's been a, a, Vietnam's been on a terrific clip. Um, I think it's finally been rewarded for being uh, one of the, the best performing economies in the world. Its GDP was just under 3% positive when the rest of the world was uh, negative. Uh, and it's looking at a, a GDP growth for 2021 of 6 to 7%. So not shabby numbers at all. Uh, and partly that's the reward for Vietnam not being locked down. Um, serendipitous reward, uh, which is by really getting a, a, a grip on, uh, on COVID last year and being able to keep a lot of its economy open. That's driven through that, that growth in, in the market. And we did a, a, a survey or, or, or looked at a survey at the beginning of part of the year that was about Vietnam's happiness index and how the people um, are really positive about the future. I think in part that's because, you know, they've got good faith in, in, the, in the government and in their economic situation, but also looking forward to, you know, much brighter days ahead globally and also further for Vietnam. So that's also translated into a lot of domestic uh, confidence and domestic Vietnamese investors in the stock markets. We've seen the stock market really um, rally since um, you know, August, September time is up 30 or percent. Uh, a lot of new investors into the market, a lot of uh, new people opening accounts, wanting to find ways to participate in, in the growth of the Vietnamese economy. And that's domestic investors. That's a, a positive sign. So that's translated into you know, strong rallies um, through into the early part of January. 
a uh, bit of a wobble through January, um, partly, you know, global concerns, the Vietnamese uh, looking outward, but also uh, Vietnam had its first uh, COVID cases for almost uh, for, for several months, uh, which are really well under control. But that obviously took the shine off people's enthusiasm just before uh, the end of January. Um, but coming into February, we've just finished the Lunar New Year, the, the Tet holiday in Vietnam. Um, and people have come back and, you know, continuing uh, to see strong uh, position for the Vietnamese economy through 2021. And so we've seen the markets pick up again over the last uh, couple of days. Mm-hmm. So um, we reported on yeah, Back to the Future, really kind <clears throat> of you know, Vietnam is this virtuous cycle of this long journey that's been on transforming its economy. And we think there's still plenty left to come. Yeah, absolutely. And just quickly, how did they manage to get through it with zero lockdown? Then, how did they cope with this? I mean, I know there's been there's been more experience with uh, viruses over there, and they're more prepared. But how does that work? How do they do that? Well, they, look, they did have some lockdown, but it was, it was fast action, really moving quickly. As you say, you know, experience of SARS back in two thousand and three experience of other respiratory infections pretty much on an annual basis, you know, avian flu and all these um, African swine flu and these other diseases. So they have the mindset and the mechanisms to really kind of close down on these outbreaks quickly. Uh, Last year, they were quick to shut down the borders, uh, good track trace uh, and control, and good adherence, I think, by the population. People do what they're told, largely. Uh, The government messages came very clear and crisp uh, with no kind of ambiguity and really left nothing to chance. So I think they, they move quickly. Um, also, you know, the country, the, the people wear masks uh, and they've you know, been used to these other outbreaks in the past. So uh, that really helped the country get to grips with it quickly. So the, the lockdown they had last April, uh, they had another lockdown locally uh, in the central part of the country in August. And then they take um, localized lockdown, if that makes sense. So in January, when they had um, some new outbreaks in the north of the country, they were very quick to lock down the provinces that were affected um, and kind of seal those off and then deal with the issues that were emerging there. So responsiveness, kind of uh, compliance of the, of, of the people to, to do what they're told uh, and to you know, not second guess uh, the government. And that's really helped um, deal, with, deal with this. And a strong communication of, of the message from the government through to the kind of grassroots level as well. So, um, and probably an element of, you know, we've, we've seen these kind of things before. We've dealt with a lot of these uh, types of outbreaks uh, in, in over the last 10, 15 years. Yeah. So obviously with that, uh, you know, a good, good amount of closing the borders helped. Uh, now that's obviously not a longer term solution. You know, economies need to get back to be fully on the, the international stage. Uh, Vietnam's been great in exporting things, but you can't, and you and I can't travel in very readily uh, into the country. So you know, once the rest of the world kind of normalizes uh, and perhaps you know, with their vaccine roll, roll out later in this year, we'll see some of the openings of the borders. But as a large population, 100 million people and a large economy, it's done pretty well, as I think the GDP growth numbers for last year showed, and this year looks pretty positive too. Yeah, absolutely. And, and just give us a flavor of, of, of the, the investments, I mean, the, the size, the amount, of the, and uh, the sector, if you could. Yeah. So the, the, the fund, let's say, is a closed-end fund listed on the London Stock Exchange, about 150 million US dollars worth of net asset value, invested in about 26 companies, we break down the, the themes into the domestic consumption. So that's playing to um, the growing per capita GDP of the Vietnamese uh, consumer. Uh, we also have a strong allocation to the banking sector. We think the banking sector is really well positioned in Vietnam, a great play on the growing economy. Uh, banks particip- seeing you know, reasonably strong levels of credit growth coming through, reason- reasonably low levels of non-performing loan ratios. So we like the banking sector. That's a ni- nice play across all of the sectors in Vietnam, not all of which are automatically kind of captured in the stock market. So I think that's a good place. We have about 30% of the portfolio in banks. As the country modernizes and the population urbanizes, that's you know coming into the cities and with increased wealth, we think real estate's a strong theme. So we've um, been backing two or three really good developers that have a good land bank and they're developing um, urban uh, properties for, for, for the growing 
kind of aspirational uh, wealth in the population as well as more affordable housing as well. And then finally, uh, Vietnam has been on this journey of being a great uh, destination for foreign direct investment. Coming, in, like coming into manufacturing for export of computers, laptops, phones, all of those things that we take uh, for granted and, and these days we use a lot of, a lot of those are manufactured in Vietnam. So we see opportunities in the linkages, in the logistics, in mm -hmm. the air cargo services, in the, in the ports. Uh, and again, as Vietnam modernizes and starts to do more domestic infrastructure spend, Uh, they need, need building materials, so they need a lot of uh, rebar or reinforced steel bar and concrete and, and plastic pipes for water transportation. So um, we like those themes as well. I think in the last thing around the portfolio, we're very you know, world aware in Vietnam uh, is more increasingly aware of you know, the environment and environmental impact as well. So we have some investments in you know, one of the largest renewable energy players in Vietnam, big solar Uh, portfolio, mm -hmm. as well as some investments in some clean water providers. So Vietnam Holding was a very early adherent to good ESG investing, very early signatory to the United Nations principles for responsible investing. So that features very strongly in an integrated way across our portfolio. So the themes are industrialization, the domestic consumer and urbanization, uh, and a very small concentrated active, actively managed portfolio. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, confident about the future? Things looking good now? Th things are looking great. Um, we're forecasting somewhere between 20 to 25% uh, in earnings per share growth this year. That's fueled by that, you know, back to that 6 to 7% growth in GDP, which has been Vietnam's kind of trend for the last almost 30 years. So we see that trend continuing. Um, we see good growth in, in the earnings of these companies. And particularly for the banking sector, as Vietnam continues to grow, that's going to do very well. And the real estate sector is uh, poised for uh, good growth in that too. And the Vietnamese per capita GDP has kind of nudged above $3,000. So it's almost it's higher than some of the other countries within ASEAN, much more you know, kind of in quotes developed economies. Um, and so we see that consumption story coming through. Mm -hmm. And so we think you know, the Vietnamese <clears throat> will spend more. Um, one thing that is lacking uh, is you know, the tour tourism industry has been hit, and that's still going to take time to come into play. Obviously, people in the rest of the world can't travel so readily. Vietnam's a beautiful tourism destination, but no one can come in. Uh, and also the Vietnamese are being very cautious with their borders pretty much sealed for international tourists. So that's, that's something that's missing in our portfolio. We don't have any exposure to that. At some stage, that will rebound. Uh, we may look at that in the future. But we're very much kind of domestically focused in our portfolio. And, you know, Vietnam has benefited from being very open and not having to suffer, you know, the great periods of lockdown that, you know, perhaps much of Europe, uh, UK and Europe's suffered. So, yes, we have good, good confidence, um, feeling good about the country, its prospects and the portfolio for this year. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, well, summarize all that, if you could, Greg, in three small bullet points. And uh, if someone's listening, likes the sound of uh, what you're doing there, but are not yet following the story, give them the three reasons why they should hit that follow button on your page on Vox Market. Add Vietnam Holding to their watch list, please. Well, the first one, emerging markets are back in favor. Um, you can only do so much in developed markets. So as people turn their attention to emerging markets, you want to find a country that's got strong, this virtuous cycle of, of, of this growth. And, and that's what Vietnam has, strong uh, strong growth position for the next five years. You also want to find um, an opportunity that's a well-managed portfolio where the hard work of selecting the stocks and managing those stocks in, in Vietnam is done for you by an on-the-ground team, um, which Vietnam Holding has through its investment manager. Uh, and the third uh, aspect is that There's tremendous growth in the earnings per share, so 20 to 25% this year. A number of our positions um, we think are very attractive value, and yet our fund on the London Stock Exchange still trades at a discount to net asset value, mm. about 15%, which is the widest discount of any of the other uh, Vietnamese funds in London. So uh, we think Vietnam Holding is a great opportunity to play the growth Um, it's good to be very selective in emerging markets. We think Vietnam's a strong market to be in, and uh, the stocks uh, at good value with good opportunities for upside. Mm -hmm. Marvelous stuff. Craig, good to chat to you, and uh, hopefully we'll catch up in the not too distant future. Thanks very much.
Looking forward to it. Thanks ever so much. The Vox Markets Podcast with Justin Waite. And joining me on the podcast right now is Glenn Goodman, and he's the author of The Crypto Trader, which I'm assuming right now, maybe the sales are dropping off like Bitcoin's dropping off, because it's we know it's aligned. We know it's, uh, you know, whenever Bitcoin rallying, people want to learn about Bitcoin. That's, that's not time. Time to learn about Bitcoin is after it's crashed. Isn't it? And then you can accumulate a little bit. Not when it's at an all-time high and everyone's shouting, it's going to the moon! When everyone's shouting that, it's not going to the moon because everyone's in, in it. Everyone's bought it. Everyone's they can buy it. gone to the moon. Do you remember that song? Yeah. In fact, no, guys, you, you just, you just said, I, I don't care Nor about am I. that. Everyone's gone to the moon was by Jonathan King. I don't care. You know, the... Uh, We're talking crypto, not Jonathan... Don't talk about Jonathan King on you. For heaven's sake. It was number one. I don't right, care about um, that. Uh, uh, what, what, are the, what are the sullied sort of uh, you know, entertainers and, and, <laughs> and artists who are going to bring up the podcast? So you've just had someone from Forbes, quite a well-known publication, ask you for a quote. I thought you meant a quote for, like, uh, painting and decorating or something. Oh, Glenn, how much for the downstairs <laughs> toilet? You know, how much for the nurse rips is? And I, 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 that's what I meant. But you meant a quote on crypto. What did you say? Yeah. Did you tell the guy to listen to the podcast? You could do it right now. Say, listen, um, three minutes in, I, I'll tell you. So Bitcoin selling off, all the crypto selling We've been saying, saying this for a while, so it's about time. It's very hard to pinpoint the actual top. But we said, listen, listen, it's been overbought and it's really hot for a long time, too hot. Steam yeah. has got to come off it. So what, did you, what are you going to say to Forbes? All right, this is what I'm going to say, Forbes, uh, and I'll say the same to you. Uh, I saw this coming. Yes, Woo! indeed. I saw it coming, my friend. Um, for several days, I've been very closely monitoring the um, situation on the futures markets, right? I'll explain. Hold on. Let me drag up Binance's futures funding history. This is a, a little bit obscure. But it's important. Uh, basically, people borrow money on Binance. It's the, by far the biggest crypto exchange in the world. And people borrow money in order to place bets, either long or short. Uh, I mean, you can do on Binance, you can do normal trading as well. You just buy Bitcoin and sell Bitcoin. But the futures um, contracts involve leverage, right? Leverage yeah. had got extremely high. Like the, the, the leverage funding costs were out of control. For the, I'm looking now at the graph for Bitcoin over the last 14 days. Um, you were looking at paying, well, let's have a look, 0.15%, about half a percent in uh, interest per day. Half a percent interest per day to borrow money to buy Bitcoin. And... What's that per year? Half percent per day. Well, that's like fifty uh, percent a year, yeah, something well, like that. Yeah, compound. Is that right? One hundred seventy-five percent more. Hold on. If you're compounding, yeah, 175... no. Go on. Anyway, yeah. Yeah. So a hundred about one hundred and seventy-five percent interest per year. You know, this is like Wonga or something, isn't it? Um, this is what people were paying to borrow money to buy Bitcoin. And when I say people, I mean enormous numbers of people with huge amounts of money because this is the biggest, most liquid crypto exchange in the world. So we're talking about this this particular futures funding basically dominating the entire Bitcoin market. And the reason why those funding costs were so expensive, those funding costs aren't set by the uh, by Binance themselves. They're set by the market, by buyers and sellers. The funding costs have got that high because the demand to borrow money to buy Bitcoin had got that ridiculous, basically. In normal circumstances, where there isn't enormous pressure to buy Bitcoin, the funding costs are practically zero. They're, they're only very, very small. Uh, because there are a lot of people who want to go short as well as a lot of people who want to go long to buy Bitcoin. And the two balance them, balance each other out. But what had happened in the past couple of weeks is that everybody wanted to buy Bitcoin and borrow money to buy Bitcoin and nobody wanted to sell Bitcoin short. And so you had a kind of tinderbox situation where anything could set that off because that's not sustainable and it had to be righted and the only way to write it is for the market to crash and loads and loads of those long bitcoin holders to be liquidated out of their 
uh, futures positions. With futures, when you borrow money, uh, if you lose too much, you get liquidated, which means your entire account is basically just uh, sold and you're forced to go flat. It's a long quote, that, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, good point. I'll have to make it a bit more pithy. It's not, when make, I, it, when it's I catchy. It to so it's not up there with Warren Buffett's quotes, to be honest. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I'll have to find a... I'll have to find a succinct way of saying that. But that's the bottom line. The bottom line is that, you know, we talk about all these other things, but that was the actual reason why it happened. Mm-hmm. Um, and and anyway, anyway, actually, there is an interesting part to this, which isn't so technical, which is that, so you had this tinderbox situation, right? It was ready to explode. But what sets it off? What set it off in this case was old Elon Musk, wasn't it? Mm-hmm. Because did you see what he said on Saturday? Well, he probably said the same as he said before on 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 um, Tesla. Is he like it's a bit overvalued here. This uh, is he say that? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, he he said. Uh, um, let's see, February twentieth. He said Bitcoin and Ethereum do seem high. Lol. Yeah. <laughs> lol. So uh, lol for him, but not lol for all the people who've just lost a huge amount of money uh, over the past sort of twenty four hours or so. Um, and yeah, that's what set it off. So you've got your tinderbox. Elon Musk says his thing. And if you actually look at the trading on Saturday, you'll see that there was a bit of a faltering in Bitcoin, but it very quickly got bought back up. So it, it fell sharply, but then people started buying back in, which is usually what happens when you're at a top anyway, because people are so confident that any kind of um, dip, they will just buy it instinctively. But then there were still lots of people selling in response to what Elon had said so the market starts turning over slowly and then eventually the levy breaks and down it goes sharply and again yesterday people bought that rally they were like oh this is a great opportunity get back in but you see the market hadn't liquidated enough of those longs so even after it had gone back up it starts rolling over and down it goes again for a second time and this time that it's gone down it's kind of sticking down a bit more than it was before and the reason that always happens in all markets not just cryptocurrency markets is because the second time it goes down people are less confident about buying the dip because they've already had their fingers burned the previous day when they bought the first dip so the second dip tends to have a bit more staying power but whether or not this turns into a larger correction remains to be seen we've already gone down 23 percent at peak to trough which is pretty significant but still not on the scale of uh, some of the major crashes during the 2016 to 2017 bull market uh, in Bitcoin, where there were 36% corrections and that kind of thing, before the market then recovered and went back to even greater highs. But that process usually took weeks or even months to to get through when you've got a correction of, of that nature. It takes a while to recover from it usually. Yeah, yeah, okay. So... It's interesting, though. I mean, as you get bigger, I think obviously you'd expect less volatility. Uh, so even like a 20% drawdown we've had, or 20% plus whatever we've had from top to bottom right now, still quite big considering the size of this, this uh, behemoth Bitcoin. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it was, it was telling actually. Is my my nephew's uh, what? I think just turned 19, I think, maybe. Yeah, uh, you but he, about him, yeah, yeah. He, he was. He just said um, a while back. You know, he said. Um, he started wobbling. I said, uh, "Do you think it's?" He said, "Do you think it's going to go back up?" I said, "Eventually, go back up, probably." Just no way knowing how if this is a small sell-off or larger one. He said, "Hopefully, just a small drop." Crazy though. And then that was yesterday. And then he said, um, "He said this morning, do you think I should pull out of Ethereum? My Ethereum holding. See, he bought it in eight hundred dollars. It's now and it's now sort of. When did it go? When did Ethereum go? It went up to like um, uh, sort of." Uh, I use my litmus paper here. So it went up to like 2,000, touched 2,000, he bought it at 800, and now it's at 1,480, you know? So it's dropped, and it's, it's almost like, it, it's almost just doubled his money. But he, I went back to him, I said, well, it's up to you, do you think it's got a future? And then he he, um, he says, I put it all in die coin. <laughs> you know, die, is it die coin? Uh, it's, it's a stable coin, isn't it? Yeah. So he's in there, there he's in, and that's why it cools off. And I'm thinking, this is the time to accumulate. I'm starting to think about uh, actually purchasing some now. Ethi- I mean, Ethereum's got a future, isn't it? Let's be honest. Yeah, yeah, it definitely does. So, you know, but just because something's got a future, the problem with cryptocurrencies, of course, is it's, it's very, very difficult, if not impossible, to put fundamental values, valuations on them. And so, yeah, Ethereum may have a great future, but 
is this price too high or is it far too low? It's it, because you can't put fundamental valuations on. It's basically impossible to know whether it's overvalued or not. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So that's why technical analysis is so important for trading cryptocurrencies because because the valuations are unmoored to reality. They're not like stocks and shares. No, exactly. What is the business? It's like, like if you if you walked into the bank, you know, hello, I'm the inventor of Ethereum, and said, all right, well, show me your business plan. <laughs> where, yeah. where is well, it? It's, where, it's where, worth fifteen hundred dollars. Yeah, where's your business located? <laughs> it was not located anywhere. It's in the sky. It's in the ether. It's, it's nowhere. What do you mean? Ethereum. Well, you can't touch it. You can't smell it. You can't see it. You can't hold it. So what are you selling then? This is fantastical, magical sort of smart contracts, networks, and all. What? What are you talking? Get out, you fool! It's another clown trying to nick money off me. I mean, you wouldn't, you know. So how do you value that? I mean, everyone knows it's sort of the way forward, but it's very odd, isn't it? So that's why. That's why so many people have problems getting their heads around it. I remember someone saying, "How do you explain Bitcoin? Try and explain Bitcoin like you would to, to your grandmother." Yeah, and how well, would she actually, get I made an that? attempt to that yesterday on um, BBC Radio Bristol. What uh, I had they, they, you know, that's a very mainstream. Yeah. Uh, what was it? Lunchtime show or mid morning show? Yeah. And uh, so they they asked me to to go on and do ten minutes explaining what Bitcoin is. Go on, then. which was difficult. But Don't I, do well, 10 I used some of the analogies that I've used on this podcast before. Um, I compared it to air miles for a start. Uh, you know, air miles, you can't touch them or anything, but you know that they exist and that they're worth something and that you can buy things with them just because you can't actually touch them doesn't mean that they're not meaningful, mm. right? But then, of course, the presenter quite rightly picked up on the fact that air miles, uh, you can put a valuation on them because the company puts a valuation on them and it controls the value set from a central you know, perspective and it uh, decides how much you can buy with them. And that's a fair enough comment. He's like, you know, what what decides that for Bitcoin? And the answer is for Bitcoin, it's just the market. It's demand and supply. So, so you know, that does make it in that sense less real than uh, than air miles or or a centralized uh, currency like Robux, which we've talked about before on the on the kids game Roblox or V Bucks or any of these other sort of in game currencies. Uh, what 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 sort of underlies if if you want to put a fundamental kind of basis to the valuation of bitcoin you have to rely on its code and the integrity of its code and the fact that the code limits the supply of bitcoin and keeps it very very small so the supply is you know just trickles out over the years uh, whereas the demand obviously fluctuates up and down wildly which is what causes the price to fluctuate but you know that is what is underlying the value of it is quite simply that calculus that in Insists that you can't create much more of it. And in that sense, that's why people who are really into cryptocurrency respect it even more than they do gold. Because gold, even though it is something that you can touch and all the rest of it, ultimately it's a useless, you know, shiny rock. It's not even hard metal. You know, you can't even hit someone hard over the head with it. You can't. It's, <laughs> Well, you can, I suppose, but, but it's not the best tool it to use, hurt though. That much. Yeah, it was not the best tool to use, really. A hammer is cheaper. So, really, you know, exactly, but the, but the point is, even gold is fundamentally pretty useless as well. In fact, you could argue Bitcoin is more useful because it is actually a payments mechanism, albeit a rather flawed one. But you can use it to sort of move money around and buy and sell things and so on. But but anyway, the the point is that uh, with the the, the sort of the fundamental valuation of it, like gold, it's sort of unmoored to fundamental reality, ultimately. It's just decided by the market, but that doesn't mean that it doesn't have value. Nobody would argue, well, gold doesn't have any value because there's no way to fundamentally value it. And, and as for the supply constraint, got, this is why a lot of people respect Bitcoin more than gold. Gold has a supply constraint, sure, but when the price is higher, gold miners can ramp up their production quite significantly. So they can respond in that way, whereas with Bitcoin, you can't. You know, there's no way to do that. So in that way, it makes it harder money even than gold. So that's the argument. <laughs> that's the argument for it. I, I can't even remember why I started this. Yeah, why did no. I start this? What, what, what do you mean just... <laughs> Your journey on crypto and Bitcoin and all that oh, stuff generally. You asked me to, you are, that's right. You asked me how I'd explain it to to a beginner. And that was my very complicated explanation. That's no good, is it? 
That's yeah. no good. That's okay. too complicated. No, no. It's, yeah, can you keep it anything? Anything short and pithy? Can you not do that, then, please? Please. Um, uh, well, I did it on the BBC Radio Bristol. I was quite proud of myself. Mm. They, they all said, oh, we get it now. That's what they said in that voice. That's how people talk in Bristol. Yeah. Oh, we get it now. Yeah, OK. Right. Um, Marvellous. Yeah. Well, listen, um, what's your thoughts? Uh, well, I, I, I assume you've got it right the, uh, the perfect point, did you? I will say that again. I, I, I guarantee you got the perfect point on Bitcoin because you were long last week, weren't you? Yes, I did. Get How do you out. do it? Then? How are you so brilliant? Because of those, because of the futures funding that I talked about, it was like even though I didn't know when exactly the market was going to crash, the fact is these values were unsustainable. So even a week ago, I was getting very worried. But by by sort of the weekend, and particularly after Elon Musk made his comment, I just started thinking, "This is, I don't like this. So, you know, I didn't get out immediately because I'm a technical trader. I waited until the first signs of a uh, of a, um, a fall. But I got out very quickly, yeah. I got out quickly. I even, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, what are you doing now then? What's your what's your um... I also bought the dip yesterday actually, but then I um but then I sold it again quickly because I could see it didn't have legs. Yeah, why are you doing well, that? Is that that's a, that's trade, a dirty yeah. trader that. You got yeah, you know, that because yeah, yeah. that is no tr- there's no trend there. You say you buy the trend. Well, yeah? there was a short-term trend in that. Yeah, yeah. Right, right. <laughs> there's a trend for a second. It's a very I short-term have trend. I shouldn't this. I shouldn't have Do you know what, Glenn, it Glenn? As, uh, uh, no, 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 there wasn't. When you see something sell off that hard, there's no trend. All right, the market turned around. Uh, when I'm talking trend, I'm talking day trader type well, trend. Tra- okay, you, look. What you're doing I there is changing the, the definition of the word trend. That's All what right, you're doing. Me, hold on. Just let, let me explain. In in my book, in The Crypto Trader, I, I make it very clear that I I think day trading no, is a very stupid idea. Right? Where, where's that in the book? I've got the book here. I know, it's throughout, peppered throughout. <laughs> right, <laughs> you're making it hard work down for me. You? So I've got to just go through 240 pages okay yeah i'm afraid so but anyway yeah i make it clear that i think day trading is a mugs game for nearly everybody See, there are a few people who are really really good at it but they're they're in a tiny minority. oh day trading 84 to 86 here we are oh it says it in the index well that's yeah. nice what do i say about it then you say day trading is a very fruitful way to earn money probably one of the best ways you can earn serious money over a day <laughs> You, you actually had me going for a minute there. I was like, well, did I say that? No. No, day, I did not day say trading, that. He said, day trading is for losers, literally. Whenever yes. people ask me what I do for a living, I tell them I'm a trader. They reply, you're a day trader. Is that what they say? Always, <laughs> I'm a trader. You're a day trader. Quite often, yeah. I trade the day. Who wants to buy some day? I'm selling night. I'm long day, short <laughs> night. In fact, I'm 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 not decided on the afternoon yet, though, or early evening. But um, I'm long day. Sh- no, in fact, Glenn is short day, long nights. Uh, they say you're a day trader, and I say no, I'm not a bloody day trader. Oh, no. <laughs> do you say that? I do. I, say, I love that I say, conversation. Are you? Let's go through that conversation again, right, Glenn? You're going to play. Glenn Goodman will play the part of Glenn Goodman. I'll play the right, part. Okay. I'll play the part of just a random. Right. Um, what, in what kind of scenario would this happen, Glenn? This this meeting, this chance meeting with someone like this? Well, it would have happened pre-COVID, obviously. Yeah, in a cocktail meeting or just what dinner party? Yes, yeah, in a, in a cocktail bar. Or a cocktail or a bar. Fancy so, so cocktail bar. So you say, you say, or you say, a so, upmarket made a veil dinner party. So would you know me? <laughs> I wouldn't know enough about you to know you. So how are we, how are we chatting? What's our chance here? What's, how are we meeting? How's that come We're, about? We're in a uh, a BDSM dungeon together, and uh, you're about to do something very unpleasant to me. All right, so I say, hello, I'm Kevin. I do for a living. (laughs) I say, hello, I'm Kevin. What's your name? (laughs) Uh, My name's name's Glenn. Hi, Glenn. What do you do for a living, Glenn? I'm a trader. You're a day trader. No, I'm not a bloody day trader. Oh, and then Is that what up, I wrote in the book? And, and, no, look, and, and, and then they look a bit offended for some reason. Like, oh, Glenn, I was just about to get some lube out, but not now, because you've shafted me with that nasty comment. 
All right, well, I'll, I'll, let's go back. Okay, accept that then. You're not a day trader. You've put that. No, I don't you, like day trading. The point is, but you did I it did. yesterday. You did it yesterday. I did it yesterday. Do you know yeah. why I always say that? I've, I've done, I, you know, I've done lots of videos on, on, on learning. I teach myself pretty much, and I, and I, I put videos out there to help others as well because I think this is what I've learned. And um, I did ten lessons way back, and I'm starting to do them again now for, for my website. Ten lessons I've learned from investing, and these are yeah. genuine lessons I've learned. And, and, and lesson ten, I think, last time, I'm, I'm probably going to repeat it, but tweak it a bit, make it better was discipline. I said, so, okay, making lessons, and those lessons I've accumulated, I've accumulated and evolved and tweaked them over years, and it's taken me experience, and I've plowed into these 10 lessons. But it's so easy to make good lessons, and it's so easy to break them. It's very hard yeah. to stick to them. The hard bit is sticking to them, because when you're in there, you see something dropping like crazy like that, or you see an opportunity, you think it's an opportunity, you can say, oh, I'll temporarily break with my rules. Yeah, and that's a, such yeah. an easy thing to do, isn't it? I absolutely agree with you. Uh, th I, that's my my life struggle. Basically. Discipline, discipline is uh, one of the hardest things. Discipline, week. discipline, which the, the the pair of us learned together in the dungeon. You may remember we were yeah. talking about discipline there. And it wasn't me. It's I was Kevin. If you were in there, oh, yes. I wouldn't do. So, <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't yeah. visit. That. I like how you pretend it wasn't you in the mm, dungeon. Mm. Okay, okay, whatever you want to believe. Anyway, so uh, yeah, discipline. Discipline is uh, is all important. But yeah, yesterday, basically, what happens is there are very rare occasions where I see a day trading opportunity, and it's very rare. Right? <laughs> We're only talking every every year or something like that. You know, every couple of years, right? I I I see an opportunity where the market is moving so sharply in one direction or another that I just think I got to jump onto that and make some quick money. And uh, yesterday was an example of that. So that all sounds really good and actually even quite disciplined in a way that if I only do it every year or two. But the reality is that like everybody, I'm, I'm only human and sometimes, occasionally, I will do that and, and screw it up. And so actually, probably uh, day trading, even though I do it very rarely and supposedly only in wonderful cases, over the years, I'd say those day trading excursions have probably not made me any money anyway. Once you sort of top them all up, I haven't totted them all up, but I suspect that I haven't made money from them because on the times you get it wrong, you lose money very quickly. And on the times you're right, you make money very quickly. But I'm not always right. It's very, very hard oh, you are to dead. day trade successfully. You know, as I say, some people specialize in this and are amazing at it. I've seen them at work, but there are so few of them, like literally just a handful of people in the entire world who are really, really good at day trading. And then there are millions of people who are terrible at day trading and lose money. I mean, well, the statistics from academic studies tend to show that around 90% of day traders consistently lose money. Even ones who've been doing it for decades continue to lose money. And I've met some of them. I've, I've even trained a few of those people in the past um it's it's really difficult you know people who've been trading for 10 years but day trading and consistently losing money because you it, it's something you can't sort of learn necessarily to become good at you have to have a very very specific technique to make money in very specific circumstances and if you do that then you can be successful at it you know what we're probably going to get get listeners now saying i don't know what you're talking about i'm a successful day trader but if you are actually i'd be interested to hear from you because I, i'm always interested to talk to talk to these needles in in the haystack oh, yeah i don't want to talk to a needle in the haystack hey listen um no, yes i did a video of, uh, again i said start my 10 lessons again and the first lesson is about risk okay and um I said, there's, there's, there's controlled risk, is it known risks and unknown risks. The known risk you can control. I'm going to go through five of those you can control and yeah. just to manipulate the odds to your favour. To me, it's not a gamble. It's not odds against. It's better than, you know, it's better than even odds. That means your chance of success is better than 50%. And one of those um, you know, was start uh, exposure, complete exposure. But one of them was spread betting. And um, I said, you don't have to spread bet and day trade. If you go to IG, it's the biggest play trading platform, and they say right there on the front screen, 75% of the people who spread bet, retail investors, spread bet and tr day trade, lose money. That's three in four people. Why even try and attempt to beat that stat? There's no point. Don't bother, you know, because uh, you, you play the odds. Don't go against the odds. Play the odds. Yeah. And that's one of the things you can do. Why investing and gambling is different is, 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 is not similar. You can sway the odds. And one of them was as well, uh, don't bother with wildcat all drills because the chance of success there are, are at best one in three. 
that's ridiculous. Don't bother with um, starting, I mean, uh, investing in pharma companies that are going, going into clinical trials because the chances of success there are about 14% which is stupid. It's, you know, it's no windy. You need higher than 50%. So you may get on. It's pretty worth getting into it when they're in past phase one and phase two, then pre-phase three maybe. But there's lots of things you can do to just sway the odds in your favour when investing, you know. But when it comes to day trading, you can't. You don't know where the share price is going from one second to the next or one day to the next. It's ridiculous. The long-term trend could be up, but the daily trends... We're all over the place. There's no trends. It's just randomness, isn't it? Especially, you know, there we are, so... That's right. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. 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 I mean, I, I agree to some extent. There is a lot of randomness in uh, when you get to that kind of time scale. But then you do, like yesterday, get those strong, strong trends intraday sometimes as well. Mm. And uh, and yeah, and I made money at it yesterday, so I'm feeling smug. But the problem is, whenever I feel smug about having made money day trading, it encourages me to try the same trick again. Um, next time it looks like there's an opportunity and that's usually when I mess it up because usually the second time around when I'm feeling smug I will attempt to do something in circumstances that aren't quite as promising as the previous time yeah. and uh, mm. you know sort of like oh that looks like it could work oh I'll give it a go because it worked last time but it only worked last time because it was a very unusual circumstance this is the thing that that my ego tends to forget Mm. It's a constant battle for us, for us investors and traders, isn't it? To keep a keep a lid on our ego, and also on our extreme fear. Mm -hmm. These extreme emotions are dangerous. Mm. And on mm. that, there, mm. that's, that's an interview there with Glenn, the crypto trader. Mm. Thank you, Glenn, for coming on BBC Radio Bristol. Lovely. <laughs> it's funny how they do that, isn't it? Local news, like BBC, with just. Bitcoin's rallying about. They want to get someone on. BBC local Brit Bristol now on Bitcoin. We got Glenn Goodman. He's a professional trader, day trader. <laughs> yes. I'm not a bloody day trader. Oh, cut him off. Cut him. He's swearing already. These bloody crypto <laughs> traders. They're really a foul mouth, don't they? What's wrong with the old investors? You won't get, you know, proper investors talking like this on the radio. <laughs> I don't know why I'm going to Irish then. Uh, Are you still recording, by the way? Have we actually finished? I, I have no idea. I think we have finished, yeah. All oh, right, we have. <laughs> Good. No, no, no. Uh, yeah, no. The guy, the thanks, guy Glenn. I'm... I said, no, I'm not, but might as well tell you thanks now. But, 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 brilliant, it's finished. But uh, yes, our time's up. Glenn, thanks so much. Anything else, any, anything else to say on the podcast? Hold on. Are we still on the podcast or not? Yes, because I'm still recording. Yes, it'll go out. Oh, okay. Uh, right. Um, yes. No, I have nothing more to say. Well, that's the end of the Thank podcast. You. Cheers. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye. Oh, bye. You want to say bye to get, make me finish it? You can't just right, leave sorry. me hanging. Bye. Okay, it's time for the top five most followed companies on box markets in the last 24 hours. They are at five. Omega Diagnostics down 9% to 86 pence. At four, Argo Blockchain down 8, well, 19% to 17. Of course, it's going to fall sooner or later in line with Bitcoin. In fact, down 23% right now, two or five. At three, Catena Innovation up 13.6% to 3.75. At two, Clear Leisure, a massive riser yesterday, 80% on uh, on the back of John Story uh, investment, £1 million, of course. John has come on the podcast. Nice guy, John, sharp investor. And at one, Ridgecrest, it's up 16.67% to 2.1 pence. Uh, let's check out the top five most red RSs. Uh, here they are at five, Cirrus. Energy, Serenus, Serenus. I'm not, I'm not sure if I'm saying that correctly, but uh, I'm trying to. I'm, I'm hope, hoping I got away with it. Uh, Moff Tenu, uh, 1008 Wow Flows, 4.8 MS Scuffs on test. Mm, that's catchy, catchy RNS there. Um, I3 Energy, operational update. Uh, at 3, Ridgecrest Holdings. At 2, Canabo Group, UK Medicinal Cannabis Distribution Agreement. And at one, Vila Technologies proposed placing to raise 1.5 million and notice of general meeting. Okay, those are the most read. Check those out at voxmarkets.co.uk. Thanks for listening. Much of us appreciate it. The Vox Markets Podcast with Justin Waite. Nothing in this podcast is intended as investment advice and the people in this podcast may hold positions in the stocks they talk about. Do not buy anything based solely on a tip or recommendation. Please do your own research.